Jack, thanks for uh, being here. Welcome. Uh, today, I would like to uh, discuss a, a couple uh, subjects for our listeners. Most of the people who will listen to this already know you. Uh, the main topic I want to discuss today is um, being a healthcare professional and how quantum biology uh, is going to be a better step or a more productive step into the future if we talk about uh, medical healthcare. But uh, first, I would like uh, to talk a little bit about, yeah, what is quantum biology? For most people, it's still a little bit fake or hard to describe. Well, I mean, it's it's that's actually a very interesting question to start with. If, if you think people think it's fake, then basically they're saying reality is fake. Everything that nature is based on is based on quantum mechanics. So it stands to reason that medicine, health, everything would also be on it. Uh, the the real interesting part to me is that people actually still question this because it's blatantly obvious. Uh, so what does it mean when somebody has this mindset? It means that you have a lot of learning to do. Um, yeah. That uh, if you don't understand the basics of something, how could you ever hope to master longevity, aging, you know, even just basic things, you know, going to your doctor. If your doctor doesn't know the basics, are they really able to help you? These are the things you have to question. Um, so from my standpoint, uh, everything is based on in quantum mechanics. And it's our job to figure out how does it impact this part of life? And why do you think most healthcare professionals or doctors are missing these basics? Is it just because of their education program? Or? No, that's obvious. It's the education. Look, the, the way the educational system works in the United States and the way that it works um, in Europe is you have a centralized control. That's the curriculum. They teach you what they think you need to know because that uh, satisfies big pharma and yeah. mindset. In other words, your focus determines your perception. <laughs> so if your focus is on, say, centralized medicine or allopathic medicine, that's where you're going to stay. It becomes incumbent upon the patient and the doctor to realize that there's there's holes in the paradigm. And then you go and fill those holes by going down rabbit holes. And hopefully when you go down those rabbit holes, you begin to realize the whole paradigm is full of shit. Um, okay. And then you, then you begin to question you know, everything that you're taught and you go, okay, I need to learn about the things that I don't know about and stop worrying about the things that I was taught. You know, I have a, a pretty famous saying I use in most podcasts. It's really hard to drink a nice bottle or a glass of Bordeaux when your glass is already filled with shit wine. You have to dump the old wine out to drink the new wine. It's no different with this idea that you have to unlearn to relearn. That's the whole point. Yeah, and if people want to do that, let's say unlearn to relearn, uh, where would they start? Because that's a question I get a lot, and of course, I always refer to books. you and, and and the books you. Well, the, it's easy now. Uh, when I started this out twenty years ago, it was very difficult because there was no books out there that you, yeah, you could you pick up. All the Russian papers, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I did that initially, but it, it was even worse than that. It's one thing about reading the papers, like PubMed is always there. But you can go source things in the literature that have been out there. Um, these days, now you can buy books, you know, right off of Amazon. The, the key thing is you have to be willing to read things that go against, you know, what you're believing. And then when you read it for the first time, like when you understand truly how photosynthesis works, every doctor should be stunned by what happens at a chloroplast. Then they should start to go, okay, chloroplast looks just like hemoglobin, then what's happening in hemoglobin? Or what's happening in the mitochondria? So in other words, you fuel the curiosity, and then you say, okay, now I need to go read this. I need to read that. After three, four, five months of doing this, you begin to realize you're not reading any of the old stuff. You're reading all the new stuff, and you start to go, this is, this is a game changer. You know, this whole paradigm is bringing us down to a level that's, you know, at the level of electrons and protons. We're talking about the subatomic level. We're, we're even, even in some respects, even below that level. Um, but for the basics, um, 
you begin to realize when people want to come in and talk about their lipid profile, you kind of just chuckle uh, because it's so inconsequential. Um, but yet everybody, you know, who you'll see in uh, the longevity space, you know, the, the big names, that's the level they're still at. And yeah. ultimately, I'm not interested, and this may come off really cocky, but I'm not interested in patients that are interested in that level. Like the people that are buying Peter Adia's book, I tell yeah. them, stay with him, keep doing what you're doing, and then when everything fails, then come talk to me. I, yeah, because yeah. I'm very, very confident that what most of these guys are selling people is absolute 100% total bullshit. And the reason that I'm so confident in this isn't, doesn't come from me that I'm right. No, it comes from nature. All the time also. Yeah. <laughs> it comes from nature. Be, I mean, so. look, if nature's yeah. wrong, I have good company. Like I'm okay. <laughs> I, I yeah. don't have any problem being wrong with the laws of nature. I, 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 I never want to be characterized as being in the same boat with the guys that are famous in the longevity space, because I actually think that they have an incredible sense of myopia. Um, for them to think some of the things they think, I, I just, honestly, I sit back in, a, in my chair and I go, how do they believe this bullshit? And I mean, obviously I understand it because yeah. I used to believe that bullshit too. Um, but once you open your mind to truly science that you've never learned and you understand the implications of what you didn't know, and it turns out that it's the single biggest part of what, you know, is really the base pyramid level for a longevity, for health, for performance, for really for everything. That's when uh, you have to make a decision as the person, the clinician, you know, the patient. Do yeah. I want, do I want to focus in on this space or not? Yeah. And th that's also one of the topics that comes back a lot in, in my environment. A lot of people listen to your podcast with Andrew Huberman. And first of all, one of the questions was like, hey, why didn't Andrew post it on uh, most of his social media or his YouTube or whatever you want to want to call it? I can tell you the reason for that is because of who he works for. You have to realize yeah. Stanford University is one of the architects of COVID. They're one of the architects of misinformation. And yeah. this this stuff that we talked about, Let's let's put it this way: for the people that spend and and give them money, this is not the information that they want out. Because let, let's just put it this way: if the sleeping lions in Europe wake up to what's in that podcast, yeah. you're going to realize, wow, how much bullshit are we really buying? And yeah. ultimately, when you do podcasts like that, um, because I I told a lot of people there was a lot of critiques. After that podcast, I said, look, you need to look are at this you, podcast. Uh, Andrew, or what do you mean? Well, meaning that people are like, they wanted us to go more into the science and this and that. And I said, you don't need to understand something. This podcast was just three guys, random guys, talking about what science is missing. And yeah. what Rick wanted me to do is, is just explain from an 80,000 foot view um, how melanin relates to the Cambrian explosion, how it relates to Darwin, how it relates to evolution, how it relates to what happened with mammals. And this was only like, uh, how shall you say, charcuterie tray of the work that I kind of do. Yeah. And people, I think when they heard it for the first time, they're like, no, no, let's talk more. Let's get more in depth. That's not what the conversation was about. It was really about Rick wanted me to kind of tickle the curiosity of Uberman. And Rick still believes that he is curious. I I have my own feelings on this. I think who he works for and what he's doing um, has a lot to do with why he hasn't assimilated some of this. And it's almost like in 2023 and 2024 after this, because we're almost a year after the podcast now. Yeah. Um, I think he's still focused in on the centralized stuff. And, and he may never never ever get to this level and to be honest with you i'm okay with that too he was uh, kind enough to listen um and then ultimately he decides but you have to realize and this is why this is important he has the biggest and what people call the best science podcast yeah. in the world right now okay that's that's what people say and you can tell from the numbers that's the truth he's right up there with joe rogan 
ultimately yeah. that tells me that most of the people in the world still like centralized bullshit. So yeah. you as a, a content creator have to make a decision. Do I want to stay where all the animals are because it's a target rich environment? Or do you want to do what I'm doing? I, I am not interested in those 95%. When I do yeah. a podcast with anybody, 5%. If there's three people that listen to this podcast that understand what I'm saying, guess what? The, those those three or four or five, six, seven people, those may be the people that change the world. Yeah, no, no I, I spread your message for the last 10 years, not only as a content creator, but also with our uh, with our private practice with a, a couple other uh, doctors i'm myself not a doctor I, I just learned everything from all the books you read and a couple other studies here for the basics but most people who are listening to this are already on that track and 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 the platform we are building in holland is is, is pretty uh let's say not big that that's too much but it, it's growing fast so i think a lot of people are waking up but in the end what they are going to do with it and that same goes that's a question for you i had as well uh, how many centralized doctors do you see moving into the decentralized Rome in your oh, a experience? Lot. A, lot. a lot. And uh, yeah. I, I will tell you that uh, I think I think the end of 2023, the beginning of 2024, like um, <laughs> some of the things that I'm getting ready to do on the global stage is actually why I'm so optimistic. Um, I think I'm going to become a real problem for some of those people down the road yeah. when people begin to realize that there is now a trend in the world where people are fed up. Like, for example, you know, you're European uh, right now. Everybody in Europe is censoring what's going on in Germany, what's going on in France, you know, with the farmers, that farmer yeah. Yeah, protest is actually Holland with the farmers. Right. There, yeah. That, those protests are time. about, about yeah. this. People don't realize fundamentally farmers are basically quantum biologists to plants. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what they are. And quantum yeah. biologists of food. And they're telling the governments, look, we're sick and tired of you aligning with global elitists, the people that are in the World Economic Forum. And we're, we, we are going to do something about it. And I don't think that people look at like those displays in Europe the way I do. To me, this is people standing up and saying, I'm sick and tired of the paradigm that you've been forced to live in. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, it could be politics, but no, I don't think it's politics. Also, healthcare, healthcare. A lot of people are sick of the healthcare. Uh, we have 11 uh, million chronically ill patients in in a country where where they live 17 million people. So I think people are waking up to that when it comes to healthcare as well. Well, I I definitely think that what's going on with the farmers is a proxy for what's happening in healthcare. I think in the United States, because I get to sample it because I go back and work in a broken system. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, I just came back to El Salvador late last night after working for a week in the States. And I see it every week I go back. I'm like, it's almost like being on the Titanic and watching it sink every week I go back and go, <laughs> when I come back here, I go, why, why would I want to live the rest of my life on the Titanic sinking slowly when I could be on the ark floating around with the animals that have made a decision to make their life different. And do you need to still fundamentally it's that simple. Do you need to be on the Titanic from time to time to, to build the arc or, or are you already a little bit well, moving past that as well? I, I, I would say, I think you need to be on the Titanic to engineer the arc. make sure that the arc is built for the storms yeah. that you're going to face. I mean, that yeah. I do think there's a benefit, you know, if you talk to an engineer, an engineer can always improve, you know, functions that fail. I mean, just think about, you know, the kind of cruise ships we have now compared to all the ships that sunk since the Titanic. You know, going yeah. on a cruise that's transatlantic now is a much safer uh, adventure than it was in 1911 and 1912. And yeah. do I think that the healthcare system will benefit the exact same way? The, the big issue, though, with healthcare systems, because remember, in every country, 196 countries in the world. Right now, there is connection between healthcare and state. What does decentralized medicine fundamentally say? Yeah. This is what makes it a game of one of one. Take the state out of healthcare. Yeah, right and the part, yeah. when you take the state out of healthcare, what does that mean? 
A, it means the doctors assume much more responsibility, but here's the part that, you know, I've been saying it for six months to podcasters and I don't think they realize it. It also puts the onus on you. In other words, who is packing your parachute? Like, are you listening to Dave Asprey, Mark Sisson, uh, uh, Rob Wolf, Peter Adia? If that is your stable of experts, you are not going to like the decentralized system. Why? Because pretty much everything that comes out of their mouth, we are going to refute it. And if you continue to do it and your results aren't good, we're going to go like this. Um, the key is, though, having the opportunity uh, to have doctors who have the decentralized mindset to teach you about nature, to, to teach you truly how lipid rafts work in seasonal changes, not the way lipidologists or <laughs> cardiometabolic guys, you know, in Western medicine think that yeah. it works. Um, then I think you get to choose as the patient. Uh, and I, I ultimately think that when you have total informed consent between the doctor and the patient, then the patient, even if the patient makes a mistake and chooses the wrong doctor, that's kind of like the Titanic. It's kind of like what we just said about the engineers. You have a chance then to re change the course that you're on. And, and it becomes very obvious to you that what you believe before the focus that you had, maybe this isn't not the focus where I want to be, but the problem is you always need healthcare professionals out there pushing you against your beliefs. Like one of the big things that, you know, I just did in, a, in the last three podcasts that went live. Um, I talked to a couple of PhDs and another guy in the UK about the problem with muscle hypertrophy in the modern yeah. world and how it relates yeah, to mitochondria. on my list as well. <laughs> right. And I would just tell you that when I laid the whole case out in those three podcasts, you know, the, it started with a 17 year old kid when I did the podcast on the roof of my house. Uh, then it continued with Dr. Alexis Cowan, but then the guy from England, Miller and Evans, Miller was the only guy that showed up. The other guy, Jack never showed up, but we talked, huh. I think over a period those three podcasts, a total of five hours. And I think when you parse that whole thing together and you think about the concepts that I taught people, then they'll understand my context for why I say the things that I do. Then it's okay. You're allowed to disagree with me. Okay. Yeah, I'm inviting yeah. you to disagree with me. But what I'm saying is you need to understand this perspective because I happen to know that it's radically different than what most people believe. I understand that. If you don't think that I don't understand that, you are an idiot. Okay. I get it. But you, your job as the mighty contract, as the black swan, is to take something you fundamentally don't believe, listen to it, examine it for yourself, and then decide. That to me is yeah. actually what centralized medicine really is all about. And those are the people that I'm looking for to do those type of things and if and that's those... what i always try to explain to to patients who or people who are in healthcare like hey you're not a doctor but you're still doing this you're, you're swimming upstream and i'm just telling you yeah, that's what you need to do you may you have to make your own decisions do your own research well you're the ceo you, you, you are a doctor forward. you have a doctor inside your head but yeah. you know the problem is people don't listen to them look look it's look these are so common sense things i don't have to teach people uh i should say animals quantum mechanics they, no. they listen to their instincts. Well, what yeah. I'm saying to people is, how about you listen to yours? You know, yeah. when you saw the cats lined up and they're all laying in the sun, in the sun. if the cats know how to do it, why don't you? Why? Yeah. Because you've been told by the dermatologist, the pediatrician, you know, for your whole life. Yeah. Or, or, it's not or good. Thing that, you, that people think that there are not animals anymore. Like, yeah, I'm not like a cat. I'm not, I'm not like a cow. I'm not. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not... that, that to me, <laughs> to, to me. To explain it to people. <laughs> That to me is is like one of the, the key things about nature. Like when the first question you asked me, humans don't believe they're animals. And they are. They are not only the animals, they're mammals. Yeah. And when you understand what your clade of animals have to operate by and all the different things, like when you see the similarities in a blue whale, when you see the similarities in a Weddell seal, when you see the similarities of a hippo or a lion or a polar bear that are in you, realize that 
certain aspects of biology have been amplified in different mammals, but the basics in every mammal is all the same. The thing is yeah. the environment brings out these abilities as the environment varies. And, you know, just as you know, Holland is radically different than the 13th latitude where I am. I mean, the, the funniest part about talking about this right now, I just left the United States. It took me a full day to get here because of the big storm that's there. I mean, at, in the bottom of the United States, it was minus 11 Fahrenheit, which is yeah, like minus 25. And I'm in Mexico now. So, uh, yeah, right. it was really hard to get here. I had to drive four hours to get to Houston to get on a plane to get here. The point that I would make is a day like yesterday compared to a morning like today, when you see the environment that I woke up in yesterday, where it was zero degrees C, and today it's you know, a 79, 80 degrees in sun, I can navigate both of those environments. Like the reason I can do that is because I am a man. Forget about yeah. a human. It's because I am highly adaptable in different environments and I can adapt relatively quickly to those environments. Those are the things that we need to explain to patients because Why, that's the case, family yeah. of animals allows us to do that. Not all animals can adapt that fast. That's what makes no. that's what makes mammals fa uh, fascinating, and it also is the basis of really uh, Rick and Uberman's podcast with me. I was trying to explain to them that this leptin melanocortin pathway is the thing that gave us this huge adaptability that we went from underground to living on top of the ground. That is a radical change yeah. for clade of mammals to go through. After an asteroid hits, it's very similar to what I just told you about what my life was like yesterday and today. I mean, yeah. that cold Arctic plunge was kind of like an asteroid for my biology. But I mean, as you can see, I'm sitting here talking to you and thinking, you know, I didn't get taken out by the asteroid because of that adaptability. And I guess what I'm trying to say to you is when people have that fundamental question, what is quantum biology all about? This is what it's about, what we just said. It's about yeah. understanding how those processes are built into ourselves so that we can do the things that we do and then blowing these concepts up and talking about like one area of what we're doing. And to me, uh, that's important. Yeah, it is. Can we dive in a little bit deeper? Uh, maybe not, not too long then because you already had a lot of uh, uh, other podcasters talk about it, but about the, the there's such a, a frame of reference, like if I have big muscles and a six pack, I am healthy. Can you explain a little bit more why uh, you and I don't think that's the case? Well, I, I'm going to be very provocative when I say this. Um, most people, and I, I'm, I'm not going to assume your audience knows this, uh, people who are physically fit, who have the six pack and muscles, those are the people now dying post COVID. Explain to me. Remember, you remember what the analogy was? Uh, in 2020, 2021, all these fat people in the United States are going to die. They didn't die. It turned wow. out that nobody started dying until they got the vaccine. And guess who's died more than anybody else? Young, healthy males. Okay. Tell me how that's possible if your paradigm works. And yeah. see, the, the people in that paradigm will say, oh, well, that's because it was exogenous and this and that. I'm like, okay, is EMF not exogenous? Do you think that maybe EMF has a problem for fat people? Versus people who are physically fit. In other words, the same argument works. But the problem is the people that are part of the allopathic paradigm don't understand how that, you know, science can flip on its head. So the real issue with muscles, to explain it, you said your audience knows. It's very simple. Doug Wallace has said that as we age, 10% heteroplasmy goes up. So what does that mean yeah. in English? It means energy. Your ability to transform it reduces constantly as you age. That's right, yeah. So if you hypertrophy muscles that use energy, does it make sense that it would steal from your brain and your heart? It's that simple. I mean, yeah. this is the story of Robin Hood all over again, but not in a good way. It's stealing from the rich and the poor and what the humans yeah. not from heart disease and, and brain injuries. So that is the fundamental reason why from a decentralized perspective, that's not a good thing to do if you want to live to 122 years old. 
No, yeah, and and to understand correctly, but also to explain it a little bit, it's literally that the mitochondria from your heart and your brain are going into the muscles to deliver the energy there, and that's why it's literally stealing uh, the Robin Hood case. Or no, I wouldn't say that. That is not correct. Re remember that uh, energy is a zero sum game. See, this is where you have to bring the physics in. Remember, the first law of conservation says energy cannot be created, destroyed. So you yeah. are not <coughs> stealing from the heart and brain. What you're doing when you hypertrophy your muscles, you're actually your biogenesis power. Your regenerative power is being redistributed in your body to where yeah. the, the tissues with mass are. So you're not stealing the mitochondria. You're stealing the electric power that powers the mitochondria to hypertrophy here. And that's what mitochondrial biogenesis really is all about. But once you move that electric power grid to your pectoralis or your ass, no, you don't have as much for your heart. You don't have as much for your brain. And this is the, this is the part that centralized players, they don't understand. They don't functionally understand what Doug Wallace has said. And they certainly don't understand Cleaver's power law. Uh, if they did, these metabolic scaling laws, and you would think that these people would do, because most of them are food girls. They like to talk about all the bullshit they know, but they don't understand what they don't know. You know like This is the ultimate Dunning-Kruger effect. And when I point this out to people, like I've been doing for the last six, seven, eight months, people are beginning to wake up to what I'm saying. It's not like Jack is anti-muscle. I'm not saying that at all. No, no, Jack no. is telling you that I want you to have decent muscle mass, but I don't want you to do it to the point where you're harming the electric power in your brain or your heart, because you need both of those as a mammal to live to a hundred to 122 years old. Yeah. And what you always say, that's what I try to tell people as well. I'm a tennis guy. So I, I played sports my uh, whole life outdoor, maybe except for, one or two winter months when it was like really snowy but that didn't happen much anymore the last couple of years in holland if you work out just make sure you do it outside can you explain a little bit more why uh working out on the blue light is uh yeah basically bad or, or not functional right you know i i mean not that you probably want to go down this road but if you uh, want to cut this you can cut it but it's kind of the story that I shared with Rick offline when we talked about ACDC and Metallica, you know, a lot of people don't realize Lars Ulrich used to be a tennis player and ah, he's, okay. you know, the basis of Metallica. So all of the things in Metallica start with the drums. The reason why is because he has the highest redox of everybody in his group. ACDC, exactly the opposite. Angus Young, the guitar player, all the, the major chords and everything there starts with him. But where did he start? He started in, the tropics in Australia and then migrated to high latitude um, UK. Most people think he's from the UK. He's not. He's actually yeah. from Australia. So he's lived for a long part of his life at high latitude. And, you know, his brother used to be in this band. His brother's now, you know, alcoholic, drug addict out for the same reason. What, what did I just explain to you about muscles? His brain and his heart had the power zapped out of him. Uh, and, we can understand this as physicians. And I tried to get, you know, Rick, my friend, to understand this because he's the music guy. He always used to say to me, and he doesn't say it anymore because he understands it now. Metallica was driven by the drums and ACDC driven by the guitar, yet they both play heavy metal music, but they do it in a different way. But that way is functionally tied to the redox power they had when they were young men. And the crazy thing is when Lars left, you know, uh, Europe, where did he relocate to to play tennis? To Los Angeles, because the weather yeah. was better there. Yeah. And then that's before, you know, he gave up tennis and then became, you know, a drummer for Metallica. But even the story of quantum biology is found in heavy metal music. And <laughs> to me, these are the kind of things that I find interesting because I always tell people, if you pay attention to nature... Like I've made this comment multiple times, but I don't think people really understand how incredibly important it is. It's not what your expert knows that's so important. It's what your expert notices and what they don't notice. And that story that I just told you about Metallica and ACDC highlights 
about things that were going on in my brain 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first sat down and met Rick and talked to him and listened to the stories that he would tell us about his business. And even in that business, I was able to pick up things about those guys that most of the doctors would never, you know, never put got. two and two together yeah, because of the quantum biology perspective. Yeah. And then when you, when you realize that those guys, you know, those two musicians are no different than your friends, the people that you talk to, when you actually see this in someone else's life and you point it out to them, you know, the, the hardest thing I think for people to hear, like I, I would imagine if I had Lars and Angus sitting next to me right now and they heard this story, People yeah. have a hard time saying that's really what the difference was. Just as, you know, one of your clients may no say, blah, blah. Yeah, you're right. They're like, Dr. Cruz, this, this, there's no way that it could be this simple. And I'm like, it is this simple. Nature it is, yeah. built it. That's the reason why the wild animals don't need Jack Cruz. They, no. it's, it's, they live by the fabric of nature. Like yeah. there's no hippopotamus that is going to leave you know, Africa to come to Los Angeles to play tennis. They just no. be in a hippopotamus in the tropics, you know, in Africa. And they're okay with that. People keep forgetting that humans are the one mammal that have migrated all over the planet. And just because they can migrate tells you about the wonderful adap adaptations that we have. But it also comes with the mindset that what is the trade-off that we make for this adaptability. That's really at the core of what decentralized medicine wants to get clinicians and patients to understand. Like when you make a decision in Holland to put Apple iPods in your ear, I want you to understand what that means. When you make a decision to watch TV, because uh, you know the soccer match is on and you want to see the game and you do this consistently say over a season, at night and you're out drinking pints of beer with your friends. I want you yeah. to know what that means after you do that for one year, three years, five years, 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. And I think yeah. when you be begin to understand that perspective and focus, then I think you begin to understand, okay, what Jack is really talking about is this is a study. Decentralized quantum biology is a study of how energy is transformed manipulated and used in different organ systems in our body as we change our environment. And it turns out the environment is critical to how energy transformations happen in us. It's not that the cell somehow controls it. Kind of like you said before, like, oh, well, we can just steal the mitochondria from the brain and heart and put them in our muscles. No, that's really not how it works. Uh, and I know a lot of people think about it like that. Yeah. Because it's easy to think about it like that, but that's not how it works. Um, about the earplugs, um, I never wear them. I wear them now because otherwise the mic wasn't working, but it, you brought up something with EMFs. Can you explain a little bit um, about why EMFs are um, so bad for health? Because I think if, if I speak for my audience and, 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 and the healthcare uh, system in Holland, or let's say the influence healthcare system, most people are, are getting the sunlight part, are getting the grounding part, but the EMF part is like, nah, that's way too much out there. That's, and, well, that's and then when I first, to it. address Andrew Marino's book or or stuff like they're that, then they're all like, yeah, that's think too about old. It. That's not... It's like sitting down a heroin addict and say, hey, let's talk about heroin. And you're like, ah, I'm okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, alone. But here's the thing where it starts. How does this whole thing start? Realize that the sun is an EMF. Hard yeah. stop there. Once you actually realize that, then you go, okay, so for 4.8 billion years, we're out of that EMF. So when you introduce new EMFs from wherever it is, from China, from Holland, from the United States, I don't give a shit what it is. Yeah. Then you think about where do we get all the EMFs? They have to be plugged into the power grid. So isn't that the story that I just told you about the heart and the brain and, and your muscles? Isn't it exactly the same story? Turns out That's it right. is. And it turns yeah. out the power density that you invite uh, in your environment to come around you, your mammal system is going to adapt to that. Now, when you zoom all the way in to where I want people to be, what is the key change? Calcium ion flow in mitochondria changes the free radical signaling. So what did I just say to you? At the smallest levels inside you, electrons and protons 
change the way they can act in mitochondria. And that changes your phenotype. And yeah. to prove to you that I'm right, in the United States, uh, they did a five-year study called the NTP toxicity study. Yeah, I know. I talked about the study a lot. Yeah. It was released on November 1st, 2018, and it showed 2G, 3G causes massive problems for mammals. So if you already have the stuff published in the research that shows it, and then you listen to what I just said in this yeah, podcast. Yeah. When I address that paper, those people, people, those people that say, but what you should do is make a little video clip of this little part that you're talking about right now with me and send it to them saying, you're an idiot. If you believe that the, the, that EMF doesn't affect the things in your cells, you really don't get it. And you can hand them Marino's book. They're not going to, you know, that's like handing a, a heroin addict a book on addiction. They're going to be like, yeah. bro, I don't care Fuck about no. that. But yeah. they don't even realize why they're addicted. And it's also tied to the effects of the EMF because of the, the effects it has on dopamine. They don't want to know any of this. Why? Because the Institute, the FCC in the United States, the tech tech people have got us all addicted to our iPhones, Samsung to the, their phones, to the internet. We're using computers to talk. Yeah. I'm not trying to tell you, you know, you have to get rid of the heroin completely. What I'm saying to you is just use it wise. Be more yeah. wise. Have discretionary use of how you use technology so that it doesn't interact with your biology to cause the problem. So come out, side. Come yeah, out in the sun. Like yeah. Hey, no. I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to tell people to do. I don't think that that message is really a difficult message to get, but it is a difficult message when the person that you're training or you're talking to is a heroin addict. And yeah. you need to understand that. You need to understand that if you're the clinician, how, do you do you have experience talking to addicts? Most people yeah. don't. That's uh, if you want to know the truth. That's what being a centralized doctor is in the United States. Every single patient is addicted to some bad idea, and your yeah. job, if you choose to accept it, is to get them to stop being addicted to that bad idea. And you have to explain to them and reason with them, put them in situations. Where they're able to control their own health as the CEO. Once you actually show people that they are the CEO and they do control this, bro, then you have a chance to yeah. change your life. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that's happening with a uh, with a lot of our pa our patients, but also a lot of uh, members. I've been a member for a long time and I've seen a lot of. Uh, let's say remarkable maybe it's not that remarkable but from the outside in remarkable changes in, in people their health um one other topic that's that's coming up a, a lot especially in holland that i know of maybe uh, anywhere in the world is uh talking about um when it comes to uh, eating fish and that the fish is full of mercury or that the fish is bad or something like that and of course you explained a lot of stuff about it when it comes to your redox potential and stuff and, and, and the melanin. But can you explain that a little bit, why you don't have to worry about uh, eating fish that much fish. as people in Holland do? Let's start at the beginning. Uh, if they can keep you away from fish, they can keep you sick. That's issue number one. So you need to realize the paradigm wants to convince you that fish are bad. It's the same reason why Bill Gates wants to block the sun. Exactly yeah. the same analogy. Now, what you need to know is you need to be smarter. Uh, mercury in fish is a bad problem, but guess what? Nature is helping all of us mammals out. They put the antidote for mercury in the fish already. It's called selenium and seleno proteins. What's the other big issue? Mercury is a heavy metal. If you look on a periodic table, you notice it's there. If you have good melanin, what does melanin do? I've written in this Patreon series that I'm in. It gets rid of heavy metals. Hello, you don't need to go to some crazy functional medicine doctor who's going to chelate the fuck out of you. You don't need to do that. All you need to do is get in the sun. Now, you live yeah. in Holland and there's no sun and you're eating a ton of fish. Okay. Then we can have a discussion. Okay. The, the answer is don't eat predator fish. Eat the fish that normally is in the waters in, in Holland. So what are the predator fish? The predator fish are like swordfish and things like that. Generally, swordfish is not around Holland. You guys no. have a lot of sardines and mackerel, halibut, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Those are the things that you focus in on. So you just stay away from the predator fish, and then you eat at the bottom of the food chain of the fish that's in the cold water. 
And then you get sensible solar exposure. You'll be able to do fine. Uh, not eating fish is akin to not going in the sun. That idea needs to be blown up. And anybody who tells you that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you my feeling when you ask me this question, because I wanted to answer it for you the way I would answer it. But I want the people that are listening to this to understand Whoever tells you that, you need to fire them. If they're your friend, stop listening to them because oh it God. is the stupidest thing ever. In my world, as uh, in, in centralized uh, medicine, who's the person that tells people this more than anybody else? OBGYN still pregnant women in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Here, here never too. listen to the OBGYN on this topic. This is something they're fucking ignorant about. And I use the word fucking with an accent on it. Why? Because... Yeah. If you listen to them, you are going to continue to be uh, a, a an annuity for their bank account. Okay. Yeah. And you have to remember, it's not that the doctors are bad people. That's what the people that trained them taught them to believe. This is the reason yeah, why say, oh, yeah. H now wants to block the sun everywhere. Because he knows when you block the sun, since he's no longer selling software to people, he's now selling vaccines and fake food to people. So yeah. this is the reason he wants to block the sun. Why? Because it's good for his business. The reason that OBGYNs don't want women to eat seafood is so that you're creating sick human babies so that you can continue to keep coming back into the centralized system. That yeah. is all you need to know about mm -hmm. seafood. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But the, the, the mindset of the people in Holland, and we talk about that a lot in our podcast or, or even with consultations I have with clients is that, yeah, but here it's all insured and there's no uh profit uh um they don't focus on profit here because it's all insured and, and the government pays for anything and the government will never do that blah blah, blah. you you know the story it's, yeah, but, it's you, just you know those, but i'm just saying those people that have that mindset let me just tell you something this is what i do i don't want to yeah. listen to you but no. if you think that the government's going to solve your problems you got bigger problems and remember what i said to you in the beginning exactly. of this podcast there's a reason i interrupted you here that mindset is exactly why people hire peter adia Okay, they yeah. have a centralized mindset. That, that is not who I'm looking to help. I'm looking to help the people that say, you know what? I don't want a surface level understanding. I want to understand how I can retap being the CEO of me. Being the yeah. CEO of you is not relying on the government, not relying on centralized medicine. If that is your mindset, turn this podcast off because this yeah. this is not wow. for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, the fish, uh, can you explain a little bit why fish is that important? Um, I always explain it with uh, DHA, and that's 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 I understand it. It's coming from the same mind. But yeah, why don't you take just a fish oil supplement or algae or krill or something? Can you explain it briefly? What what is the big difference between eating an oyster and let's say supplementation of fish oil or? That goes back to the Uberman podcast. This is the one fact that everybody needs to know. DHA in evolution hasn't been changed one time in 650 million years. Yeah, so yeah. what is nature fundamentally telling everybody listening to this podcast? There is a damn good reason that every single eukaryote uses DHA in their system. Now, we may not know why, or I'm saying your audience may not know why, but I do. And I've yeah. taught people this time and time again. DHA yeah, has, is 22 carbons, has, has a pi electron cloud, it basically turns sunlight into an electric current. <laughs> so when you know that, and you know that as mammals have gotten more complex, we're the most complex one. We have more DHA in our brain than any mammal on the planet. So then you need to ask yourself the question, is all DHA created equal? It turns out it's not. So if you have ALA omega-3s and think that's equivalent to DHA, that's wrong. You know, that's like having a woman who has down, normal right? breasts compared to breasts from a plastic surgeon. Totally different. They don't work the same. They don't look the same. They're different. And you need to understand yeah. that. You get your DHA from algae. Uh, the way DHA works comes in chemical packages called SN1, SN2, SN3. That has to do with where the carbon chain is based on the DHA. It turns out for mammals, you can only put it in your central or peripheral nervous system when it's in the SN2 position. Guess what food source that's optimizing? Marine seafood chain. Oh, shocker. We're back yeah. to that story. Anything else, huh. like what's algo or anything, that's SN1 and SN3, which means yeah. that that is like 
plastic surgeon's woman, you know, yeah. blowed up lips, looks like Instagram, TikTok videos. You don't want that. You, no. Some of you may want that. That's not my, that's not my people. My people, no. they're going to want it the way nature prescribes it. Why? Because then that keeps you away from Dr. Cruz. It keeps you away from Peter Addy. It keeps you away from Rob Wolf. Um, and no, what's in the pill, when you take the pill out, like since we just talked about this, that uh, is a uh, the big pharma name, at least in the States, called Lavaza. That is, doesn't have all those Selino proteins that we talked about in there. So guess what? Uh, all the things, in it as well, right? That's right. the paper from Bosquet, I think. All the, all the yeah. things that are in that, it's it's almost like saying that UV light causes cancer because you're just looking at UV light by itself. But remember, in the sun, there's seven other frequencies that are with it. Full spectrum. Yeah. But that's what the dermatologists don't realize. The same thing is true at Lavaza. Lavaza is like taking one part of the fish oil story, giving it to people and thinking, okay, it's the same. It's not the same. Okay. Oh. The, if you eat a fish with DHA, it's radically different than taking a pill. And if you don't understand that, then you know what? I don't have time to be your doctor. Yeah. Yeah, understandable. Uh, another question I got from uh, one of the listeners is like, okay, uh, I understand I need to be uh, uh, in sunlight a lot, but in Holland, there is not a lot of sunlight. So and that's what people always say immediately. So that means that I get sick in Holland because there's no sunlight. No, no, no. That's not what we're saying. There's an equivalent to that, and that's using the cold. Can you explain a little bit about how um, using the cold almost creates your own sunlight in, in the way of, uh, let's say low UV frequencies and stuff like that. Yeah, unfortunately, to understand that, you you actually have to know a little about the things I talked to, to Huberman about, and you also have to know a lot about what I spent almost two hours talking to the podcaster from the UK, Owen Cheesby. the The key thing is the way mammals are built to adapt to high latitudes is you. It takes you all the way back to before the dinosaurs. The mammals that we came from lived under the ground for eight or nine months a year. So that's equivalent to like living in Holland today when you live above the ground. So realize that those mammals are able to do that. So why can people in Holland still make it in poor light? Because it turns out you have to have melanin inside your body. See, you're a white dude like I'm a white dude. Technically, we're both Northern Europeans. The yeah. key is, though, we have melanin inside of us. You can't see that. But you don't realize that's where most of your melanin is as a human. And if you live in Holland, say, for 50, 60 years, never getting the sun, wearing Chanel glasses and blocking the sun and, and doing all that, you can't keep your melanin stores inside. So the answer is you will get sick when you stay in Holland after 30, 40, 50 years because you never renovated the melanin inside you. What does the melanin inside you fundamentally do? It allows you through a very complex process, nonlinear optics, to create light stronger than the sun that you're missing from the environment. And when you're able to do that, then all of a sudden living in a high latitude isn't a bad gig. This is the reason why polar bears can do it. It's the reason why blue whales can do it. The humpback whales that are now swimming right past El Salvador going up you know, to Alaska to eat all the, the good DHA food. All that stuff is going on right now. All these processes never stop. So I don't tell people that you can't live at high latitude and win. But what I do say is if you are a modern human in Holland and think the dermatologists and OBGYNs are right, you can't live in Holland and do those no. things because you will never maintain the endogenous stores. This is the reason why type 1, type 2 diabetes and Holland's through the roof. It's the reason why autoimmunity, like MS, is through the roof. It's the reason why people yeah. in Holland are getting a lot of Lyme disease and all things like that. You don't realize all these diseases are tied to well, yeah. alpha MSH signaling inside you. And bro, the, the simple way to do it, take your clothes off and go outside. Go in your kaniki, yeah. go in you know, a geothermal pool. Be the mammal that you're designed to be for Holland. But the, guess what? That's not what people in Holland do. I've been no. to Holland. You know, when the sun's out, they're still wearing down jackets. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And or then they wonder why. And then they wonder why they have to well. listen to a podcast like this because they don't realize these mistakes are why they need to reject the things from centralized mm -hmm. medicine. It's also the reason why the people in centralized medicine are never going to get you back 
to help. They're going to sell you partial solutions that are going to fit your cognitive bias. And you're going to say, oh, okay, this is good. I can still do all the things that a heroin addict does and get away with it. I'll be fine. And then guess what happens? You find out, okay, now, um, I don't know, say your, your, uh, your, your skin disease now has turned into MS. And you're like, hold on, wait a minute. I, this is not what I want. And then they give you all the MS drugs and you do nothing to get worse. Why? Because you never get told the original story. Because now yeah. that you've been out of the sun for 30, 35 years, then you find a guy like me and say, look, you need to go to Mexico. You need to go to El Salvador for three, four, yeah. five years and remake your melon on the outside, suck it to the inside so you can make the light and then you can go back to your people. Yeah. Nobody yeah, wants to hear that message. But oh, you did no. it to yourself. That's the yeah. truth. That's yeah, that's the punch you in the mouth that decentralized medicine is going to give some of you that you're not going to yeah. like. And you know what? My mouth's not a bakery. I don't give a shit if you like it or not. Yeah, it's the I truth. Think, yeah. 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 One in every two persons in all uh, in their over their lifetime experience some form of cancer. I mean, it's crazy. It's it's insane. Um, another question that was uh, was popped in as well was about uh, cold therapy. So like uh, people say, okay, I'm not in the sun in Holland, especially not in the winter. Um, what is gonna what is cold therapy gonna do for me? Uh, especially when you talk about okay, live like you should be living in Holland. Um, no sunlight and a little bit of cold is part of that. Can you explain a little bit why cold therapy is a wise move to use if you do it correctly? Yeah, cold therapy actually increases biophoton release from your mitochondria. So you're making light inside so you can make melanin. That's the whole point. Yeah. This so is always comes... so counterintuitive to make your own light inside. They're always like, what, right. Thomas, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, well, people don't <laughs> understand that, but you know what? For them to get the idea that I'm right, all you have to do is hand them Robert Becker's book. When he shows yeah. you the studies that he did on bone that show that bone liberates red light inside through you know the semiconduction, when people read that for the first time, they go, holy shit. Or they go back and read the 1923 paper by Alexander Gerwich when you cut a, an onion bulb and you have extreme low frequency UV light that controls mitosis. You go, wait a minute. I didn't know that we make light inside. And then once you know that light's made inside and you're from Holland and you're a dumbass and you listen to this podcast, you go, okay, I need to learn a little bit more about this. I didn't know that going out as a mammal in the cold in Holland keeps me away from cancer. I didn't know that doing cold therapy could actually improve my health. So is this why the crazy Russians do all this stuff and they live even higher than us? The answer is yes. Why can they get away drinking vodka like crazy? They jump in the river all the time. And people don't realize that there's a reason for it. Like the people that live above you, Scandinavia, what do they do? They use geothermal pools to do the same thing. How about we go to the east? How about the guys in Europe that do better than everybody else that have big muscles? The the Vikings in Iceland. The Vikings, what do yeah. they do? You ever been to Iceland? People walk around in shorts and a t-shirt when it's zero degrees C. I never see that in Holland. I never see that in the UK. No, never. No. That's never. the problem. And the thing is, until you know, until you understand the basics of mammalian biology, you're never ever gonna come. To realization that that gets back to the first question that you asked me in this podcast. You don't realize what you don't know. And when it turns out what you don't know is the single most important part yeah. of how your body screwed when you live at a high latitude, you have no hope of fixing it. And what the reason I do podcasts like this is to tell people, I'm not saying that everybody needs to come to the tropics. I will no. tell you if you're really, really sick, and you're from Holland, you need to come to the tropics to jumpstart this. It's kind of like in the United States, when your car doesn't work, you call somebody to do a jump on the car. Yeah, yeah. This is no different than think... what it should happen in Holland. But that's yeah. not how people think about yeah, it. Oh, like, yeah. I go, oh, my wife doesn't want me to go. My kids don't want Well, then die. Yeah. Just get sick yeah. and die. You yeah, know, you have that's to make also something people get confused. You know, when when you have a jump start, let's say uh, I'm I'm in I'm going to Colombia after this, so I'm away for almost three months. Then people say, oh, so that's enough for the rest of the year, and you can live your normal life. No, you don't. Even when I come back, even when it's summer, you still have to be a lot of outside. And w w let's say next winter, if I am in Holland, I still need to use the cold therapy. People also think that if you do it once, the jump start, then it's that that it's good enough. It's yeah, no, no, no yeah. you need to. 
<laughs> you need to live your life like a mammal. Look, I always tell people, this is the beautiful right. part of living in 2024. You can get on YouTube and right now go to, to um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming or Yellowstone National Park. And you can see the picture of the buffalo and the elk right now in 20 feet of snow and they're out yeah. in it. So guess what the answer is for you? Show me how many people are in Holland right now that are walking around outside in a t-shirt and shorts. They're not. And there's the problem. inside because there's snow. Well, <laughs> so the problem is they think they're not like a polar bear. They're not like the mammals that live at that height. They are. And they don't want to accept it. Again, we're back to the heroin addict story. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Bottom line yeah. is you are not subtracted from your biology. You're not. And until you realize that message, you're going to continue to struggle. And, you know, I've got, like I told you, if you really want to parse the stuff about high latitude living, I would tell you, I spent literally an hour and a half, two hours with this kid from the UK. His name's I Owen. She's don't listen to that podcast. I mean, I, I parse it out for you all the way to the nth degree. If you don't understand it after that, you are in, you are incorrigible. There's no help for you. Just turn all my podcasts off and don't listen to me. And I don't want you on my tribe. I don't want you to come to El Salvador. I refuse to deal with people who refuse the answer. And what people don't realize is the answer can be staring you right in front of your face and you still reject it. Why? Because you don't like the message. Nature doesn't give two shits about your opinion. You no. are a, a thread in her fabric and you need to start acting like it. And when you act like it, guess what magically she does for you? She takes out her magic wand and goes, boom, you're healthy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Boom. You don't need to have Dr. Cruz. Yeah. Boom. You, you, you can do the things that you used to once do. And then you go, you come back and meet me like, bro, I didn't need to do this with any medicines. I didn't need to do. And I look at you. I'm like, so you're surprised. You're surprised that that's you, you tapped into the the same recipes that the buffalo, the elk, the salmon, every wild animal on the planet. Because you are a wild animal, but you don't live like a wild animal anymore. Yeah, yeah. And let's say because <laughs> I I know for sure that a lot of listeners from this are healthcare uh, practitioners because that's a group where we talk to a lot. But let's say besides the book and they want to jump on the ark or build their own ark. Do you have any recommendations where they? Uh, should focus on or should start with besides the books of course uh well i think the the number one thing is once you do the books for a healthcare practitioner you need to know more than even your patients do so that means that you're, you're going to have to do some of the things that you did like in residency and medical school like you find something yeah. you're interested in, you need to expand it you need to really go down the rabbit hole you need to be around people that have been doing this for a long time my hope is that we're going to build a system just like this in El Salvador. That I think people yeah. are going to hear that message pretty soon in 2024. I mean, we have a big event coming up called the Palestra Health Event that the president has um, has set up in El Salvador. It's called the Age of Light. And I think when people find out what we're planning to do, first country ever, then I think practitioners and other places are going to go this is a very interesting um this is a very interesting um way to do things it's, it's not going to be for everybody i don't anticipate everybody in the world coming um no. to practice here because it's going to take a while to get this up but i will promise you that there is going to be a different perspective in el salvador than it's been in any other country we are going to fully yeah. decentralize Healthcare, it doesn't mean that you can't bring your centralized healthcare here and still do it. You'll be able to do it, but you're going to be judged on a meritocracy. So if you think lowering everybody's LDLs are really good and jabbing people is a really good idea when you come here, you're going to be judged against the people that believe exactly the opposite. And then we're going to see how things go for 20, 25 years. Then we'll decide what's best for the mammals that are on the ark with us. Okay. Yeah. And then you're going to be able to look at us like, you know, as a Northern European, the people that do the best job in, in uh, documentation and data collection of the Swedes, Swedes go back almost 200 years because they have such good data. We're aiming to do the same thing in El Salvador 
except in this part of the world. And you're going to be able to see decentralized versus, you know, allopathic versus functional medicine versus homeopathy versus chiropractors versus um, any kind of crazy bullshit that you want to come up with. Then ultimately, you as the practitioner, you as the patient, you can decide who's going to help pack your parachute. Who's, who's the wisest to help you get back what you've lost? Ultimately, to me, that's what informed consent fundamentally is about. It's about medical freedoms. And there is no medical freedoms in any country today on no. January, I don't know what's today, 17th? January 17, 17 yeah. 2024. I think that that is going to change in El Salvador sometime in the first quarter of this year. And when it changes, most people in Europe, most people in the United States won't know what it means, but I promise you before I'm done, they're going to get it loud and clear. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're still planning on going uh, full speed ahead because the last time I talked to you was in a consultation and you were like, yeah, it's been, it's been a big bulk of work, but you're still going to continue to, to push this. Well, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I okay. just know that I'm bringing the change that needs to come to the world. I haven't yeah. decided what I, how I'm going to do things and how I'm going to participate. Uh, I feel like I've done enough. Uh, I want to know when you're going to start helping, when your patients are going to start out, when the people that are out there listening to this, when are you going to get off, off your ass and start doing something to make the change in the world you want to see happen? Why do you just sit at home and Holland and keep complaining? You know what? Do something. But yeah. this is what it's all about. You want to change the world, bro? Absolutely. Let's go. We yeah, got we got a lot of places in the ark. You want to come down and help the government out? You you want to come and uh, start your own business down here and decentralize? You know your practice. Okay, but I can tell you yeah. this: it ain't going to happen in Mexico. It ain't going to happen in the United States. Certainly not going to happen in Europe. That I can promise no. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're going to have an opportunity where you're going to be able to play soccer on a level field. Okay. And you're going to be judged uh, by other doctors that have an open mindset. You're not going to be judged by the medical staff bylaws. You're not going to be judged by the people that give you your license. You're not going to be judged by the people in the state. You're going to be judged by your peers. Yeah, and that's nice. Let me tell you something. If you think charging people $250,000 and they don't get better after a year, I'm going to fucking bite you like a great white shark. So don't yeah, think you can bring your bullshit here and get away with it. Not going to happen. No, um, no. You are going to, it's a meritocracy. You're going to physically have to help the people that hire you. And if it's shown that, that your science doesn't, you will not be welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for it. I'm down for it. We had the conversation of, about if I should come to uh, El Salvador, what I can do, but that, that's for an, uh, another time. But um, oh, one question before I forget it. So maybe it's a little bit of a setback, but um, can you explain a little bit about the melatonin? Because that's a question I got a thousand times and a lot of people, or at least in my environment that I see from, let's say, friends or family or people who don't want to listen are supplementing melatonin like crazy. Uh, can you explain a little bit why that's not it? A wise thing to do you make melatonin from sunlight the amount of light that is in your environment is charged um it's got a charge density you make it in your mitochondria no you're not making it where the functional medicine guys tell you the predominant place you make it in your body is your mitochondria so if your mitochondria star for sunlight you can't make melatonin the reason why the functional medicine doctors keep putting people on melatonin is because they're correct everybody doesn't have it but when you take an exogenous supplement, guess what you do to the endogenous system in you? You turn it off. Yeah. Okay, it's very Same simple. It works just D, like, right? just like, huh. just works just like a, a heat pump or an air conditioner in your house. You know, if do you think the AC will ever come on if you have you know cold air already in your house? The answer is no. It's very simple to understand. The problem yeah. is the way melatonin works. It's the charge density of the tissue. Okay. So if the charge density of the tissue is not good, you won't make enough melatonin. Taking melatonin makes it worse. So you never want to take melatonin. Instead, you want to take your clothes off and get out in the sun. Why? Because melanin helps you make melatonin, which raises the charge density. That's what increasing your solar redox is all about. Then you can make your own melatonin and you can take the pills and throw them in the garbage. You don't need them. Yeah. You need to change the... Uh, the environment that you're in, you need to embrace the cold. 
even the cold will help you make melatonin. The, the thing is, everything starts with light. You need to realize the sun and cold are a light story fundamentally. Food is a light story fundamentally. Everything is a light story. So when you come to this, you need to understand you have a broken light story in some way, and you need to hire somebody who understands that. And if they don't understand it, and they don't understand all the parts of it, you will not get the results that you want. But you, generally, lions and hippos, they get the results they want. Why? Because they're always yeah. outside. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Thomas, I got to go. I got things yeah, to do. Me too. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.